I am Seymour from ACPE, and we have Greg and Mike from Richland who are going to be talking about PCI compliance and the importance of having a lot of different components in place so that you can meet all sorts of requirements um, from the demands of your schools and your business office to what are the legal implications that you have to meet. So at that point, I'm done. I'm turning over to Mike. Great. Thank you, Seymour. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming this morning. You guys all see that okay? Good. So I decided to sit down so I wouldn't block the screen as we're both up here so you guys can see the slideshow. So um, thanks again. My name is Mike Leesberg. I'm the Executive Director of Information Technology for the Richland School District. This is Greg Pipkins. Uh, he's our network engineer. So he's the technical guy and knows uh, as far as the implementation processes and all that hardware stuff that we've got to go through and all the hoops we have to jump through. And uh, Seymour is exactly right. This isn't uh, for the faint of heart. It's a long and winding road. It's going to take you a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort to get there. But um, ultimately, what you're looking at, in a nutshell, is you're de trying to determine how much risk your district is willing to take when you start accepting credit card payments. That's really where you're at. It's what level of risk you're comfortable with from, we don't care, we're going to take them until something happens, and then we'll worry about it then. Or you can be proactive and try to be upfront with everybody and make sure that you're compliant from the get-go to ensure that if and when something does happen, that you've done the right things and you've taken the right steps to make sure to mitigate whatever you can and you're, you've been following the standards all along from the get-go. I think uh, you'll find if that's the case, that, uh, in the long run, that'll be better off for you. Uh, but again, it's just well, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how much risk your, your district is willing to take. Um, first of all, let's start with some definitions here. If you're not familiar with these terms, a lot of acronyms here. So PCI means payment card industry. That's what it stands for. Uh, it's a comprehensive security program and it encompasses many different layers and I'll go into that here in a second. Uh, you have basically the standards body, the security council that runs this, that sets all the standards for the different uh, uh, people that are involved in this. And again, we'll talk a little bit here in a second about the ecosystem and what players are involved in this because it goes from those that manufacture devices to merchants to vendors and so on, okay? Uh, you have the, the DSS, which is Data Security Standard. That's what we're talking about when we say PCI DSS. That's really what you're talking about when we're discussing PCI uh, compliance. And then here's a website. Oh, and by the way, um, I'll make sure that I don't have this delivered, this group, and I have some this uh, presentation and some other handouts. I'll get those together and post those online. I'll have my contact information at the end as well. If you want to reach out to me ahead of that, I'll make sure I bundle it up and get you guys the information that I'm going to share today with you. Okay, uh, this link right here at the bottom, this is the basic the website that you're going to go to for the most part and get you started. Everything's going to be pretty much right here. Um, I will let you know up front, it's daunting to navigate the website. You go different places, different levels. Uh, it's hard to track where you're at. I got bookmarks all over and they all take me back to the same place. I can't figure it out. I bookmarked it. This is where I want to get to, but I'm back to the same, uh, same place over and over again. Um, all right, some introductions. So basically... Uh, if your district accepts or processes payment cards, uh, then PCI DSS applies to you, whether you want to admit that or not. <laughs> Basically, any mer <laughs> it does. Any merchant that stores, processes, or transmits cardholder data must comply with PCI DSS. And again, we're talking about that risk factor that I just mentioned a minute ago. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to give you guys a detail of the requirements needed, what you're going to have to do to satisfy these. They're pretty. Um, when you look at them at, f at first glance, they're very um, simple it seems, but as you dig into it, they become much more restrictive uh, and so on and so forth. So we're talking about 12 requirements that you have to meet, but each and every one of those requirements has sections and subsections and subparts of subsections. So it's not just one line item per requirement. There could be multiple requirements to fill that one underneath it, okay? Uh, and again, uh, it's necessary to achieve compliance with modifications to district technical information, so your firewalls, your servers, your PCs. We'll talk about hardening those when we get here in, in a bit. Uh, patches and all that kind of stuff comes into play, much more so than you normally would, just to make sure that your machines are up to date with Windows patches, per se, as an example. Um, you're also talking about a lot of operational things that are going to be modified or changed. Your processes and procedures through multiple departments are impacted by this, from the technology department to the finance department to the bookkeepers in your high schools that take credit card payments, no matter where that is. We'll talk about that too, because it 
every uh, there's going to be situations where you're going to take credit card payments. It's not always going to be at the school. We have fields, we have soccer fields, for example, that are off-site across the street, down the hill from the high school. They accept cards there. We have to make sure that we can get that connectivity and we're doing it the right way, just as if they were on site at the school. So some of these things are going to be challenging to achieve as you go forward here. Um, risk management again, then incident response. One of the things that we're going to come up with, is I'll show you about a little incident response thing. Uh, you have to be prepared in the event of something going wrong, unfortunately. And you should do that up front and make sure that you're ready for that. That's one of those old adages. It's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when, right? And it's, it's going to happen to somebody at some point in time, unfortunately. So again, everything we're talking about here today is related to what's called cardholder data or CHD. So when you see that acronym, uh, that's what we're talking about. When we first got going down this road in 2015, um, we were at version 3.1 compliant. The com it's now been upgraded to 3.2. Uh, in the past, I think it was 2014, it's gone from version 3 so to now version 3.2. So changes appear or happen, excuse me, slowly over time, but they do make modifications and they tend to be a little bit subtle as, as you look at them if you want to go back historically and look at the different versions and what the updates have been to each different version. But most of it, the requirements themselves have remained the same throughout those versions and subversions. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, here's the ecosystem that we, as we work through this process, each and every one of these industries is responsible for applying or for um, complying with some type of PCI standard. Whether that's the uh, manufacturers of the devices themselves, they have to apply, uh, excuse me, comply with PCI PTS. If you're uh, software developers that's writing the code for these applications to interface with the hardware and software. You have to comply with PCI PA-DSS. We fall into the merchants and service providers category, PCI DSS, because we really are merchants. Whether you want to call yourselves that or not, that's really what you're doing. Once you take payment, you become a merchant, right? And then finally, this is the ecosystem, and once everybody is everybody playing by the same standards and the same set of rules, then we have PCI compliance across the board from from start to finish, so to speak. So here are the requirements that set up the 12 requirements for uh, to achieve standards, uh, PCR requirements. So the first one is you have the goals on the left-hand side. So there's six goals broken down into the 12 requirements, right? So the first one install, they seem very straightforward, right? Install and maintain configuration to protect cardholder data, your firewall, excuse me, configuration to protect and maintain cardholder data. Pretty straightforward, but again, as you start digging into it, and I'll show you an example of what some of those sections and subsections look like here. Now, as we get into this, they get to be pretty complex and they get to be really restrictive about what you're going to be able to do and what you can't do and what you need to do to achieve this requirement and make sure that you're compliant going forward. Okay. Uh, second one, do not use vendor supply defaults for system passwords and other security parameters. Seems like a no-brainer, right? But it's a thing here that you have to make sure that you're doing it and you're what ends up happening here is, yeah, you can say you do that, but what you really want to have is some type of process and procedures and documentation in place that shows that you are doing that. And there's a gotcha in here, and we'll come back to that too. Um, protect stored cardholder data. That Again, that goes without saying that's what this is really all about. But how you do that and what you do uh, and what processes and procedures you're utilizing come into play here again. Uh, encrypt transmission of cardholder data across open public networks. Again, you would think that that's, that that's pretty much self-explanatory and that you would want to do that anyway. Um, number five, use regular, use and regularly update antivirus software to programs. Again, you do that normally on a day-to-day -day basis with your devices in your school already. It becomes even more relevant now when you're talking about point-of-sale devices. Okay. Um, develop and maintain secure systems and applications. That gets back to standards and procedures probably within your IT department things that you may not be aware of, things that you're doing, but you don't have documentation steps and outlines. This really got us into the documentation phase in our department to make sure that we're documenting. We spend a lot of time and, and try to spend as much time as we can. We, we miss some, as, as most people do, time is short, but we try to document as much as we possibly can to make sure that we're compliant going forward. Uh, restrict access to cardholder data by business, by business need to know. Only certain people that need to know and have access to that information should have access to it. Okay, uh, no different than your student records in your in your SIS system. Only certain people have access to discipline. Only certain people have access to health information. 
Same thing goes here, no real difference there, okay? Um, assign a unique ID to each person uh, with, complete, with computer access. So no longer using your login account to access the POS system, your Windows machine, the internet, and so on and so forth. Your POS systems need to have a dedicated control account that you manage and monitor, and those people need to log in and log out of each individual system each and every time they want to access it. There should be no cross-account um, cross use between those systems. You need to keep them separate, completely separate from each other. And we'll go into detail about that too. Um, restrict physical access to cardholder data. Again, you're storing this information. You're not supposed to be storing it. You may be storing it uh, unintentionally, but again, whoever has access to that needs to be restricted accordingly. Uh, you want to track and monitor all access to network resources and card with and cardholder data. All of this again revolves around the cardholder data. So again, that's going to impact your technology department, uh, the processes and procedures that you guys have in play, or may need to develop to be compliant and to maintain compliant going forward. It's always going to be something that you're going to keep up with and have to keep up with. Once you get there, that's not the end of it. It's going to continue, and you need to keep making sure that you are compliant day in and day out as you move forward, as you add systems, as you modify systems, you build new schools, you bring new applications on board, all that comes into play. And then the last one, maintain a policy that addresses information uh, security for employees and contractors. Okay, You may have people that are helping the school. For example, we use a lot of volunteers to take tickets and take money at events high school basketball games, football games. Um, my data, my student information coordinator, she used to be the data entry person for the high school. She now works for me in my department. On the weekends, she goes and supplements and helps them take tickets and takes money for a couple hours a night and Friday on the football games and basketball games and stuff. Well, in that capacity, she's a part-time employee. She's not working for the district. She's now being employed by the high school because she's working for them, right? When she submits her time card, those hours get charged to the high school, not to my department. So really, she's kind of in a contractor role at that point in time, right? Because she's not working for me. She's working for them, doing what they need her to do, which may be accepting cardholder information and scanning cards, okay? So that stuff comes into play, too, there. Right. Yeah. On the, so on the on these 12 requirements here, because I deal with these almost not every day in some capacity, on the 12 requirements, if there's all subsections and subtasks all within these requirements, okay? Depending on when Michael will get into it a little bit about your different levels of where you type of cardholder data you have, there's like a SAC A, B, C, D, okay? The, when you look at the entire list, it covers every, every type of SAC option. But depending on if you, where you're at, you don't have to meet every requirement. Like there's one section there, it doesn't talk about it right out the, top, out the get go, but it talks about like software de development, you know, testing policies, things like that. Well, we don't develop the software. So that doesn't apply to us in those some of those sections, okay? So what I've what I've been building in, the, in some of these requirements is I've got kind of building some pre ring binders basically that shows question one here's how we meet the requirement, question two here's how we meet the requirement. Now some of the stuff I'm not going to put my vulnerability assessments, my logs in there because those are always changing. But we try to put in there so if an auditor came in, I can show them the binder and go here you go here's all the here's how we're meeting these requirements, okay? And if they need to see the detailed information, I can pull those out of the various uh, out of the various systems and, and meeting those requirements. So, again, it's the other thing about this is any other compliance activity. I compare this to any other compliance activity. All these are almost all the same. Okay. So if you're meeting the nice thing about this, if you're if you get you know knee deep into PCI compliance, you're almost meeting some other compliance activities because. You got to have firewall logs. You got to have change management. You got to have incident management. You have to have policies of some kind. So think of it as not only you're meeting PCI requirements, but you're also trying to meet some of the other requirements that you may have to also delve into. Also, so it's not just one bucket you're throwing this all into. So. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Okay. So really, what's at the crux of all this, and why are we here, and why do we have to be compliant? Why it matters. Um, as you guys know, we read about breaches all the time. Some of you may have been impacted personally by a breach, by one of the ones, Home Depot, Target, whoever. Some of you may have been or know somebody that's been impacted. So unfortunately, it's today's world that we live in, and it happens more frequently than we'd like to think it does, but it, it seems to do so. And so that's why we're here. The other big thing is, if you have a data breach or theft of cardholder data through the district or through the school, 
um, your liability is way up at the top. You're liable anyway because you're already taking transactions electronically, you're working with cardholder data, sensitive information, personal data, but now you're way up, okay? And so you have to have all these things in place to make sure that you've covered yourself, that you're compliant as much as you can in the event of one of these breaches. Because uh, it's going to be a domino effect. It's going to impact the cardholder themselves. It's going They're going to come after you. You could in turn go after maybe the device, depending upon who's uh, the device manufacturer. Another thing is when we're talking about PCI compliance here, not only is you have to be, you want to be PCI compliant, you want to make sure that your vendors that you're working with are PCI compliant as well on their side of the fence. Doesn't do you any good to be compliant on your side and work with a vendor that's not and have a breach issue. They're going to point the finger at you, and it's going to be your fault in a nutshell for the most part. Yeah. Just to comment about insurance as sure. well. Um, a lot of us have insurance that will technically cover a cybersecurity uh, credit card related incident, right. but they won't honor the insurance if you haven't followed the process. Right. So exactly. they can deny a claim based on your lack of following through on this process. Right. And we'll talk about that here in a second, but thank you very much for that. That's exactly right. Uh, and again, following the PCI security standards is really just good business, right? And make sure that everybody from, from end to end is, everything's up above board, you're doing what you're supposed to do, uh, and hopefully you don't run into that case where there's a breach, but you've been doing your due diligence, and if, if and when that does happen, you'll be prepared for it accordingly as much as you can be, right? I don't think anybody can be totally prepared until you actually get yourself in the middle of one, but at least you'll, get, you'll know what to expect to a certain degree. Um, just to follow up again about liability, as I mentioned before, uh, you have lost confidence in your customers. If the, the community gets out that you guys had a data breach at a school, the district, they're not going to come and want to use data, credit cards with you anymore. Everybody will be writing checks again to you. You know, coming, They don't want to do that either. It's the convenience of being able to pay with a credit card and pay online when I want to. So you've removed that convenience factor from them and it's just going to push them further away from you. You're going to lose sales because of it. Obviously that makes sense. Uh, cost of reissuing new payment cards, you fraud losses, uh, higher subsequent costs of compliance if you get dragged into this and have to go down this road, could cost you more money long term to be compliant again. Uh, legal all comes into play, legal costs, settlements, judgments. <laughs> again, the district is going to be liable, they're going to look to you and that's who they're going to come after in a nutshell for the most part. Uh, fines and penalties could also come into play. Uh, termination of, of the ability to accept payments. Maybe your credit card vendor decides, hey, we no longer have the trust in you that you can do this correctly, so we're going to pull our card from you and you can't use it anymore or vice versa, right? And then potentially people could lose their jobs over this depending upon what your, how your structure is within your organization. Uh, most of the time when this happens, the top person is going to take the hit. He's the person that's going to be in front of the cameras answering questions, so on and so forth, and that may be you, okay? Just be prepared. Again, this will help you be prepared. So what is it that they're after here? Just some more definitions here. Uh, cardholder data, all this stuff is on a credit card whether you realize it or not. There's a lot of information on a credit card. There's the magnetic strip on the back. It actually has two tracks worth of data, not just one. There's two separate tracks and each one of those tracks has data on it. Okay, I don't know if anybody knew that or not, but there's two tracks of data on that, on that magnetic stripe on the back. There's different uh, credit card valuations, uh, values that uh, different credit card companies use. Could be on the back, could be on the front, depending upon the credit card company. Uh, there's a credit card identification number. You have a payment account number, a uh, personally identif uh, identification number, a PIN. Everybody has a PIN. Every credit card has associated PIN with it. Uh, it comes with a default. Have, has it been changed, right? Have you reset it? Uh, that kind of thing. Passwords, obviously, are always a big deal here. Uh, and then the expiration dates, and then obviously the name on the account or on the credit card itself. So again, here's just a picture of that, what you're looking at here. Uh, also the chip itself now, right? We have chip-enabled readers that can do that. That makes the transaction easier and quicker and faster, but it also brings another element into play that can that holds data in it, right? Uh, so you got the PAN there, you see the cardholder name, you got the expiration date, uh, the CID here, the, the um, credit uh, verification value there for American Express is on the front instead of on the back. Some are on the back, right? Some are on the front. Uh, and then again, the magnetic strip there holds a couple different uh, data stripes on the back of the magnetic stripe there. 
some other potential threats that come into play here that you may not that you you're familiar with, but you may not think about them in the context of PCI compliance. Uh, malware is obviously a big deal. We don't want the POS terminals or the hardware that we're using uh, to become infected, right? And this is exactly we have this statement right in our policy. Uh, development or use of malicious programs that harass other users or gain unauthorized access to any computer or computing system and or damage the components of a computer or computer system is prohibited. So you're not supposed to do that. How many of you have staff that come and install software all the time anywhere on their own? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, another threat front for you to deal with. Uh, email phishing, we all know we're all going through this right now. It's, it's across the board. It's a, a big ACPE threat, has been for a while about uh, encrypting email and so on and so forth. Many of us are already implemented mitigation steps to a certain degree. For example, we've implemented a banner in ours, much like most of you have, uh, in the in the in our emails to start to put that out there to our users. Hey, be aware when you see this is coming from a non-RSD address, Richland School District, coming outside. Be aware. Just take a look at that first, and then make sure that it's the content and the receiver that you're expecting the information from. Um, social engineering, right? Social engineering can have many different attack fronts here. Uh, can take many different forms. It can be the phone call. Uh, it could be in an email, like we've seen. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you have seen the email that are going around social engineering. Uh, the principal or the superintendent asked for information, right? I need this. We had, uh, we just had a couple of incidents within the past couple, three months where we actually had, uh, the scam was that uh, they wanted some information about credit card for the principal that was in a meeting on a Friday night. Well, she followed through with it and actually went to the point of buying uh, was it iTunes cards, Greg? iTunes, iTunes cards, and just got that far with it. So she was just ready to fall off the cliff, right? right? So many different tack fronts here. You can have people impersonating other people in person in your office, right? Can be that can be ha that can happen as well. Um, internet access is also a big deal. We all know that um, it's necessary for a lot of the things that we do today. We're all pushing all of our applications and all of our business processes, a lot of them, to the cloud. More and more things are becoming uh, cloud enabled, such as you can do infrastructure as a service, data as a service, on and on and on and on. Everything can be pushed to the cloud. You really don't have to have uh, much of a physical footprint anymore in your own network because you can use the cloud for all of those things. Again, that is another attack when it presents additional problems for us. Um, a lot of people have already had certain policies in place that deal with internet access and what you can and can't do those will be refined through this whole entire process as you start looking at policies, what you already have and what policies you need to develop to, be, to maintain your compliance uh, going forward. Uh, account compromise, right? Somebody gives a, uh, somebody else's account, we've had that happen. Uh, we have it happen almost on a daily basis. Our new account compromise, a uh, little segue here is our um, students now are using brother and sister. We have one-to-one -one take home program in secondary school. Some kids, we have a restricted group because they haven't been playing nice on their computer. We put them in a special restricted group that only gives them access to district uh, resources. So they can't go to social media sites and things like that. Uh, now they're using little brother and little sister's accounts to log into their Chromebooks and get around what we're trying to do. So it happens all up and down the spectrum, right? And then public Wi-Fi, obviously. Uh, typically, it's not secure. Uh, you want to be very, very wary when you're on open and public networks for whatever reason, even on your own personal devices, right? Okay, uh, the key role players here, um, the, you have credit card brands. These are the major brands that you're dealing with. Um, you have Visa, obviously, MasterCard, American Express, Discover. Those are the big ones that most of us are familiar with. <coughs> Excuse me. There's also a fifth one here, Japan Credit Bureau. It's Japan's only international and, and payment brand accepted in Japan and Asia. It's currently being supported in the United States through Discover. Okay, so those are the big players here as far as the credit cards themselves. And then you obviously have issuing banks that are providing other the credit cards. You have processing banks that are handling the transactions. You have the merchants, us, that are dealing with the transactions. And then you have uh, cardholders themselves. Um, data breaches can lead to significant uh, adverse consequences for the merchant. Uh, like I mentioned before, unwanted media attention. Right? Nobody wants to be in front of the cameras being called out because you guys had a data breach in your school district. That'll be big news. That'll be big news across the country, right? They tend to like to point us out. Uh, universities always get flagged for all that. Uh, they, they tend to like to make uh, a point of it when that happens. Um, lost revenue and or financial damages like we talked about before. 
because people don't have any confidence in you anymore. You could be in lawsuits, uh, that kind of thing, judgments against you, fines, fees, all that kind of stuff. Um, lost time and distractions to students, families, and residents, right? Those The end user is going to be impacted by that, your community. Again, lost confidence in what you're able to do. Potential litigation, uh, that can be very expensive. I don't know how many of you have in-house counsel. Uh, we do. Uh, he's been helping us with our policies and stuff. Um, but I know also when the fact that we've got in a couple of other lawsuits, he doesn't handle all that. We contract out with another firm to handle those higher cases, bigger cases that he may not be able to, to take care of for us. So, Mike, yeah. Are you taking questions? Please? Sure, go ahead. I'm, I'm a little new to this space. Um, so where is the data? So I'm thinking, okay, I have a student store. Mm -hmm. Gate. I walk up. Swipe it. Process it. Goes out to the vendor. Where, where's the data breach in my space? What I mean, other than somebody, where did who? Yeah, I mean, who's your is your vendor hosted on offsite? Yeah, it's a uh, it's an offsite. Yeah. So again, that I mean, you're still you're still accepting the credit card payment, even though it's and it's going through your network. So right. we're the same thing. Our vendor is offsite. Right. We used to have it hosted on site, but when we went through the initial assessment, we were like on the like the most restricted because we we're hosting on site. Right. Well, we found out the vendor does cloud basically hosted offsites. We moved it offsite. Yeah. It lowers our risk, risk, risk yes. right? And the, the limit and the less stuff that we have to meet on these requirements. But your data breach, I mean, it, it could be anything. If someone's got malware on the machine, right. they could be collecting all of the credit cards right. as they're being swiped. Key right. logging. You know, key logging, things like that. Right. You know, that's, that's where, so they, these different pieces come into play. Accounts get compromised, you could have, you know, Again, this is where you keep things separate a little bit. You know, if someone's network account is compromised, they can then log on to one of the, you know, use those credentials that have logged on the machine to either probably get in, installing malware is what they're usually trying to do, right? You know. So the risk is in my the risk is in my de my device. It's in my my domain. My the risk screen. is in your network. Yeah. And, and then in my network as, the, as it's right. the transactions occurring website and you Do you have that separated off into a separate VLAN? Yeah, that's, that's what later on, later on, we got some slides coming up of talking about yeah. e-landing and this, this, segmentation. This, uh, segmentation. The yeah. SAC thing that you referred to earlier, the SAC, that, that's yeah. a different level you have to comply with based on. Yeah. Well, and I'll show you guys some of that too. This uh, wired versus wireless? No. No. It comes into play. We'll, sh we'll show you a little. Yeah, yeah, we've got a blueprint slide that shows you segmentation. It doesn't I, I do strongly suggest you encrypt uh, at the scanner level. Right. That's one of the points about not holding credit card holder data. You don't want that in your hands. Right. Uh, similar to us storing uh, student social security numbers. How many of you remove social security number from all your forms now? You don't only ask for that information because you don't want it. You don't want that in your hands. That's a liability. You don't use it anyway. Why even have that store that data? Kind of similar thing here, right? Um, and again, for the credit card holder. Um, identity theft, unauthorized charges, whatever could happen there, damage to your personal credit, financial losses, uh, and on and on and on there. Um, okay, so safe harbor. Well, we're, we're going to come back to this on the next slide, but I wanted to give you this definition so you make sure you, uh, that you understand what we're talking about here. So safe harbor protects a merchant, uh, provides merchant protection from fines in the event that they experience a data compromise, okay? So you can think of safe harbor. Now it says right here, to obtain safe harbor status, school districts must validate compliance annually, and we'll come back to this in a second, maintain full PCI compliance at all times, okay? If you're, gonna, if you're going to use safe harbor, you don't have to have be compliant all the time, but if you're going to use safe harbor in the event of a data breach, then you need to be compliant all the time. And you need to demonstrate that, as this one said, demonstrates that prior to a compromise, all PCI compliance validation requirements were fully met. And again, we'll come back to that. So those of you not familiar with what safe harbor means, okay, it's basically a provision of a statute um, or a regulation that specifies certain conduct not to violate. That's kind of backwards, okay? So for example, um, reckless driving. If you're going under 25 miles an hour, you're not deemed to be a reckless driver. Once you go over 25 miles an hour, you're deemed to be a reckless driver, okay? So as long as you're under 25, you're not reckless, that's a safe harbor, if that makes sense, okay? So it's just kind of the opposite. It deems you're not to have violated any requirement, okay? Um, 
Richland School District, when we initially got into this, this is before we actually started doing PCI compliance, uh, the finance department themselves partnered up with a company called TransArmor PCI Rapid Comply. They now have kind of rebranded themselves under Clover Security. Um, they offer complete PCI services from soup to nuts from top to bottom. We no longer use all of their suite. Uh, here's a couple links to their information if you want to find out more information about them. But you certainly could use this as a resource to help you maintain compliance. What we do now is we just use the firewall portion of it as far as doing, was it monthly? Monthly assessments. So it does a scan of our firewall externally every month and then gives us a report and lets us know whether we passed or failed. We keep that. We've kept that component in play on our side of the fence. The other thing that's an application or the service do they can they allow you to do when Michael's talking about like your annual self assessment. They they host the the self assessment. So each year I'll go in and just answer the questions for the self assessment for the PCI compliance. They also have a document repository. So all your requirements, everything you have related to PCI, you can host up in their site. So in case you have an issue, network down, whatever it is, your documents are safe there you know now again it's not going to be your up-to-date vulnerability assessments and logs but it's you know your your policies your you know your requirements things like that any spreadsheets that you might have used you know you can host them they have a document repository that you can store your stuff there so but the biggest thing is they do the external vulnerability assess, assess scan against against our firewall so it's just another set of eyes validating that what you say you've got in place is yeah. indeed correct. And the internal scans, which is another one of the requirements, I have another internal application that does the internal scan. So. You know, I've never seen the cost of this. I don't know who picks it up. <laughs> have you? Yeah. I, I, because they don't, it's all just... It, it, it's just a form that you go through, and then they have automated tests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not too much labor for them. Yeah, right. But it does simplify the thing. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah, absolutely, right? Um, okay, so again, there are multiple PCI DSS merchant environments. You'll need to determine which of these applies to you and your district. The majority of us are going to fall into what's called uh, SAC C or D. Um, so let me jump out here real quick so I'll share this is one of the documents I'll share with you guys this is just a little 21 page questionnaire about uh, PCI compliance to get just you little, 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 just to get you going here <laughs> just to get your feet wet wrap your head around a little bit oh here's the here's the one I was telling you about the um, earlier about the different versioning. You can see it started out at 1.2 back about 10, 12 years ago, right? Then it went to 2.0, and then it went to 2.1, and now we're up to 3.2 after about, uh, yeah, four or five years there or so. Uh, okay, here we go. So, this is all, this is how you do, this is the SAC standards which each different part number they call it and we're looking at SAC D and SAC C for the most part again it depends on what you how you process uh, what your business plan is and what your business model is depends on what part you're going to fall into um, so let me sh I'll pull up C and D here so you can see so C is the one that we're talking about right now merchants with payment application systems connected to the internet no electronic card holder data storage <laughs> when we, as Greg mentioned before, when we first started this, we actually were looking at being uh, D compliant here. It's much more restrictive, and you have many more things that you need to to adhere to. Much more, many more requirements you need to adhere to to be SAC D. One of the first, like he mentioned before, one of the quickest and easiest things that we did to move from D to C is move our payment from off on, or excuse me, from on prem to the cloud. That's one of the very first things that we did. And that basically brought down that restrict those requirements to a level that we can then deal with them. And for the most part, we really don't want to host credit card payment information anyway, right? You want to push that off and let somebody else take care of that for you. Oops. Oops. Sorry. Um, again, then we make you make your determination about which one, and you do that through the assessment. That's what SAQ means, um, self-assessment questionnaire. It's going to help you. It's going to give you a list of questions. 
When we took ours, it was much more comprehensive than the one that I'm looking at today. Even though we just went from version 3.1 to 3.2, it's changed pretty uh, a lot according to what I looked at before. Um, and so again, under these SAC C and SAC D, under these you're not required to submit reports for compliance reporting. However, going back to Safe Harbor, if you intend to use Safe Harbor and want to use it, then you have to be compliant and you have to follow the Safe Harbor steps to do that. So again, that's one of those risk things we talked about in the beginning. What's your level of risk you're willing to accept and whether you want to be completely compliant or halfway there kind of a thing, right? Um, if, yeah. Mr. Can you get your third bullet down? Yeah. This one? Yeah, if you do not, if you do not store electronic cardholder data, oh, and, okay, which is what you were recommending. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes, right. And we're okay. making an argument that we're going to go VIP, which is even less, or less onerous than SAC C, if your um, scanning equipment is so encrypted that your device yeah. never sees the card information. Okay. okay. So it's basically direct from the scanned device to the vendor, and you're transmitting encrypted data the whole way. The whole way, right. That, that was going to be my question. Why? I mean, I understand you went got through the startups process, you know, seven years ago. So yeah. It's changed. Yeah. So why are you continuing to do this versus, say, encrypted? You still have to do this. It's just a little bit of service. To you do have a lot of service between like SACC and the IP. So, like, yeah. so what? What is motivating you to not change your merchant providers to say a one that is end to end encrypted and say, okay, we want to offload as much of this risk as possible to the merchant provider? It's a good question because I never really looked at the difference between B and C or the, the, the other one. I, I look at C, and even if, and again, I get back to everything that's in C meets a lot of other requirements for other compliance. It's almost like I'm already doing these things. So it's kind of like, I mean, yes more security you can apply, if I can encrypt from end to end, you know, if I can put blinders on the individual, you know, and, and they don't even see the credit card, they're just, you know, I'd, I'd go with that too, right? So, right. you know, it, and again, it's just, you know, I, I feel like I'm still meeting these requirements. So if I can meet C, obviously I'm gonna meet B when we ship. I'd rather start more restrictive and then work my way up. Because even in some of the D stuff, I actually look at some of the D stuff and still kind of, you know, dip my toe into those areas too to make sure like I'm still meeting the requirements. Because you know, it, and again, it's I don't know. It's, it's, I look at the larger holistic view of sure. security. Where's the chip technology? I mean, I would assume that that's the most secure. I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm taking the swipes. Yeah, right now I think we only do swipes. We don't have we don't have chip, chip we, readers. We, we do. We have some of them. Yeah. Some? Uh, okay. What EM, EV EMV. Anybody help me? What do they call that? Um, there's a name for oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Never mind. I know where they're at. Yeah, so we do, we're in a transition piece where some of them accept chips and some of them don't. Yeah. Just like your merchants. Some merchants still haven't gotten to the chip. Others are there already. Just depends. Yeah, they did. did they? <laughs> they moved it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and what it does is so if, if you do a swipe, it puts the liability on you if there's a breach. And they just say, you haven't moved a chip. So therefore, but if you do the chip, they'll own part of that part of that liability yeah, since you've taken steps to use the newer technology. That's good to but know. But I don't think it changes anything from the complaint. Right, right no. The, the data to them is still flowing across data your on that card across your wireless, and so yeah. you, you own it. Right. Um, and a couple, of, uh, a couple of links here to some information. This is one of the documents, the PDF here I'll share with you in my... Uh, in my notes and stuff when I get that uh, sent up to you guys. Um, okay, so let's look at SAC, just SAC-C in general to give you a, a little bit better idea what we're talking about here. Um, basically, this is just a one-line item that it says, merchants with payment application system connected to the internet that uh, do not store electronic cardholder data uh, on any computer system. Again, that's what you want to do. You want to move it off. You could be a brick and mortar store, right? where somebody comes in physically, they have the card in their hand, and they swipe the card and they do business with you. Uh, you could be a mail order where you take it over the phone, right? Or you allow them to enter it on the phone, the digits on the, on the touch, on the phone themselves. Uh, you could be both of those, right? You can fill both of those slots. So uh, SAC C merchants also meet the following eligibility requirements. Um, your company has a POS and internet connection from the same device, on the same device or same LAN. Um, 
POS and internet device is not connected to any other systems. We'll get into segmentation again here in a, in a few slides. We'll get down the road and Greg go into detail on that. Uh, with your environment network segmentation, VLAN, including your virtual systems environments as well. So physical, virtual, it's all the same. It doesn't matter. You have to make sure that both of those environments um, are the same. Uh, the physical location of your POS environment is not connected to any other premise or locations or any other LAN or VLAN for a single store only. Again, getting back to the network segmentation piece of this. And your cardholder data your company retains is on a paper, a little printed receipt, and these documents are not received electronically, right? And your company does not store cardholder data in electronic format, okay? So those are the requirements um, that you have to follow to make sure that you meet the SACC requirements. Um, so getting started, how did we get here? I mentioned earlier that initially we started off with rapid uh, PCI rapid comply through the finance department. Initially, that's how we did it. When we actually got into this, we actually contracted this out through a third party vendor to come and help us. This is daunting, as I mentioned. Um, we paid the first go around with him. We did a couple little iterations with them. The first time we paid uh, 9,600 bucks, 48 hours. That's $200 an hour for him to come in and do this. So he spent one week gathering data and helping us uh, fill out the initial assessment, the preliminary assessment, if you will. And then what he did when we did the preliminary assessment, um, as I mentioned before to you guys, there's going to have sections and subsections and subparts to all that's going to be very, very granular. Once he pulled all that data together and he was able to have an opportunity to review that, uh, the, the last day he spent creating documentation for us and plans about how we were going to go forward. Uh, one of the things that he did when that review process was he took that preliminary SAC assessment and then he gave us a gap analysis. Here's what your current environment says and that assessment is basically based on how you answer questions. Okay, so let me show you what that looks like here real quick. So here's the assessment itself. This is ours, 153 pages, right? This is 3.1. The newer one, like I said, is smaller than this. Uh, but I wanted to give you an idea here what this looks like. So here's your, your assessment information, typically just information about you, uh, your third party provider, so on and so forth. And then here's the goals and the requirements that we looked at initially, right? We had the goals and then each one had a, a requirement or two requirements associated with it. Go ahead. So one thing I want to point out on this assessment if you notice, if you when you look at it, this is SAC C. You have 1.2.1, but it skips to 1.2.3. That's because the SAC D has the 1.2.2. Okay, so make sure when you do your self-assessment, you put yourself in the right category because if you take a look at D, it's got a lot more requirements in there. So if you see the skips, that's because the that that particular they have been nice enough to take that out for you so you don't have to freak out about that 1.2.2. And I can already know at this point remember what 1.2.2 is. So just one thing to point out when you're going through these assessments. So yeah. But it's usually expensive. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. It's right. more because this is firewall, so there's more there's more stuff to it. So right. you might as well hire about five more people and <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So again this is just the very very first requirement. Install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect data. Uh, and it has those all different subparts associated with it. Uh, the second one, do not use vendor supply defaults for system passwords. What are you doing with regard to that? Um, this section here in the middle, excuse me, where it says yes with C right here, uh, compensating controls. This means you've achieved requirement of this particular section or subsection by um, having to bring in some other device or software piece or something to make yourself compliant. You just weren't able to get there without an additional implementation of something. And typically, we didn't have to use any of that, right? Did you? We talked about this. There's really no reason that we could think of that a uh, district would, would use something like that in these cases as far as trying to fulfill the requirements of compliance. Yeah. So, um, and please be honest in your self-assessment. I mean, don't feel bad if you're gonna, you know, give yourself some, you know, no answers. Yeah. Because you wanna, you wanna, you want that basis. And again, between this assessment and what he did for us was he gave us a gap analysis. Here's the way you guys are set up. Here's what you need to be compliant. You need to fix these things right here between the two to, to be compliant at the very end of it. So it 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 also gives you a, 
uh, I can get another third set of eyes to look at you from the outside and give your look at what you guys are doing, how you're doing business, and and really kind of a overall broad picture of how you're doing business on a day to day basis. It's actually can be beneficial for you in many different fronts. Uh, when he got done with doing the gap analysis piece for us, um, he compiled it into a complete now SAC C assessment with all the appropriate compliance statuses and updated and so on and so forth. Um, and then one of the things that you get out of this if you go through that is what's called this uh, prioritize approach tool, which basically it's a spreadsheet that they give you uh, that has these six different milestones. And these milestones are focused on best practices protecting against and the highest risk act factors and escalating uh, threats regarding cardholder data. And there's these six factors. And I've got a copy of that here too. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, right here. So this is what that looks like right here. Here's the six different categories, all color coded. It goes again by requirement, each subsection and section for each separate one. And then you fill in this information over here to help you know whether you've achieved this milestone or not. At the very top of this, there's a separate sheet on this. Um, I just did a PDF copy, but you get a spreadsheet and there's a separate tab that does all the calculations. So as you enter one, two, three, four, five, six, it'll give you a complete percentage based on each one of those six milestones of where you're at, whether you're at 35% completion, 45%, 65%. As you start to adjust these, it automatically calculates that and tells you where you are percentage-wise to getting to be 100% compliant. So this is part of that tool that comes with it after you do the assessment. This comes from them, and he delivered this to us as well. And then once you're trying to meet those milestones, again, the gap analysis, then as you fulfill these, you'll get closer to 100% compliance, right? That's the idea here. So just another tool to help you track what you're doing going forward, what you need to be aware of, and then how soon can you get there. Um, and it, we already talked about that, about uh, re recommendations for specific steps uh, to meet compliance. So that was the first part that he helped us get our head wrapped around it and kind of give us a really good, uh, I guess, uh, framework, if you would, and give us a better understanding of what we were up against as we move forward here. Uh, the second part of this, we brought him back again. We got him in at $11,200 for 56 hours. This time he came back and helped us create policies that we needed to create. Initially, the initial SOW that he gave us um, was about 16 documents, policies. Now, um, when I say policy, they don't all have to be policy. Some of these are going to be standards and procedures, which we already had in place to a certain degree on some of them. We just helped fine tune and update our current documentation. So it's not really a policy, but it's more standards and procedures that you, that you put in play. Um, some of these may actually be a, a policy that you need to develop and have go for board approval and so on and so forth. That's going to take time, obviously, a lot of time, unfortunately, in a, in a lot of cases. Uh, one of the things that we've done with regard to policies in Richland School District is we've tried to make our overarching policies uh, very lightweight, if you will, uh, more generic, and then we use rules and regulations underneath those. We don't have to get board approval for rules and regulations. We can do that without that. And it's a simpler, easier way to go forward rather than having to write a policy, everything you want, something changed. You, those of you that have been through that process, it could be pulling your hair out, you know, right? So go to rules and regulations and just make it easier on yourself. And then when things change, when you need to update documentation, it's much easier to make that happen sooner rather than later as you go through those. Uh, these are some of the ones that we had developed for us. Information security policy applies to the district in its entirety, includes all the systems, the network, Applications that process, store, or transmit sensitive information. Uh, router and firewall standards. Greg already knew this, apparently, right, Greg? He had all this dialed in. Um, the IT department standards for firewalls, routers, network equipment that provides control points, network security, and connectivity to information services and applications. Just gives him a little bit deeper, more things to think about to make sure that we're doing the right things. We have been doing the right things, and if what we've missed, and if not, what we need to address. Uh, includes change management, which is a key piece. We really don't have a lot of uh, change management process. We haven't had in our department until this came up. Uh, we just kind of, okay, we'll do that, do this, do this, do that, right? Somehow somebody has it on a sticky note in a folder and a binder and a, and a file cabinet. Well, now we document. We document, document, document as much as we possibly can. 
Uh, and again, this is one of those rules and regulations. This is more for the IT department, but it's important that we do that to maintain that compliance. Again, if you go clear back to the safe harbor discussion, this makes sure that you're that you are and fall under safe harbor. I, I recommend on the smaller school districts. I mean, you know, if you get in a, you know large school districts and or large organizations, they might follow you know change management and the management problem management processes. If you do all those things, well, obviously in the smaller school districts, it's only two or three people. Okay. So if you can, if you can in your change management process, at least try to have documented somewhere on being able to do your sanity check when you're making those changes to the firewall, especially. You know, it, it, it hopefully you might have somebody else. If not, you might have to even just reach out to a, you know, an adjacent school district if you're a smaller school district, just for somebody to do a sanity check on if you're going to be doing a major change. Now, if you're just updating, you know, a rule to allow an IP address, okay, you don't need, you know, reach out but you know internally I, I you know I have a junior network engineer who him and I bounce I, you know I do the sanity check off of with the change management but like I don't have for us I don't go to Mike for every major change unless it's like we're going to be doing massive changes or something like that but it depends on your change management process. So do you have a CMDB to track everything that is related to the credit card handling path? No. no. That's, I mean we don't have a formal board to do, that's what I mean. Like, uh, CMDB a database of uh, assets Oh yes. Yes, I have. I have an, a list. We have, you know, various either automate either through automation, Active Directory. Now, I don't have like a single spreadsheet per se, but I know the locations to go get, you know, user accounts, devices, Anything and then any good. other systems that are in play that make up the whole entire credit card holder data environment. So, you know, so yes. Go ahead. So if our, if all of our processing is done through like a you go to our school district website and then from there you follow that the security on that is different than when you have a physical swipe on the device, correct? Right? On site? Yeah. On site. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean for us if we wanted to we could, you know, we have a student's you know online payment processing right. that is actually handled all third third party. None of it actually goes through our network other than the physical web, no different if you go to Amazon. Exactly. Right. But it's the physical, because we physically are swiping or taking, you know, cards, that's where the difference comes into play. But 20,000 plus and we're just being able to have somebody swipe a card. Yeah. yeah. Now, again, I think we just had, you know, we, we spent the time, you know, to be able to bring somebody in to give us that, you know, additional look at all this stock. Because again, like I said, when you're first looking out, that's a lot of information to go through yeah. initially. But, you know. <coughs> Swimming upstream real fast. Is that intellectual property protected, or could you share? You know, well, we could, we could share. Because yeah. I could pull out all Richland School District stuff. and yeah. we've got basic templates. I mean, yeah. you yeah. know, you can piggyback on, I guess, what we've, we've we spent. Why yeah. should we all spend taxes to pay your dollars 50 times? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's not intellectual property. Yeah, he, gave it, he, he, he developed that for us, so I'll be happy yeah. to share what, what he gave us. So we, he gave us templates, and, and a lot of the templates he gave us were Honestly, real generic templates that yeah. we have custom since customized. You know, either as we're working on the board policies for various pieces or the internal process and procedures. Because what the you know difference I know I came from a non-school district environment. You know, when I think of policy, I'm thinking policy, but policy to a school per district person thinks board policy. So it's it's terminology like you know data retention and disposal policy doesn't that word policy doesn't have to be a board policy. That's right. a Procedure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what I was mentioning earlier. So, so I mean, and I apologize. That's okay. If you guys covered this, but did you have any difficulty in getting non technical folks on board with dealing with this? Rather yes. Than yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Yes. <laughs> so, so, that's that's kind of yes. Because right? that, that's been all the technical stuff we, well, we can handle. I, I'll get to that. It's yeah. The, that part that, it's uh, the journey. Go back to the business <laughs> manager and say today. And yeah. they go, no, it's not a problem. Just right. go to this right. PCI. All the other districts do it. Hmm? Yeah. All the other districts right. do it. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. Yep. Well, they do understand that, surprisingly enough. I mean, they would keep it for their job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 Um, and then data retention and disposable. We never even thought about this, to be honest with you, until this came into play. Uh, and this specifically applies to cardholder data again, and then to district personnel that handle that in the, in the course of their duties on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
He also helped us with some access control and password policies. Um, applies, you know, to the district in its entirety again, all workforce members. Uh, further applies to all systems, networks, and applications that process, store, and transmit sensitive information. Physical security policy ensures that physical access controls exist to ensure that all cardholder data can only be accessed by authorized personnel. Um, basically what happens, I mentioned earlier about some of our soccer fields being away from the school, we have a little uh, firewall that they take with them to use now it, when they do take cardholder data. When that thing is not in use, it goes back in a vault and it's stored and locked away. No, we don't want anybody, nobody should be picking that up, handling that, nobody should be messing with that at all, except the people that need to use that whenever they need to use it, right? So those kinds of things we're talking about here. Uh, usage policy, this kind of basically was one of those where I mentioned about a modification to existing one. Our acceptable use or responsible use policy is 2314. So we just had to tweak a couple sentences in that to adhere to this part of it. And um, one of the things that we added there to it was that you can't uh, transmit uh, via personal messaging applications, cardholder data we're talking about here. You can't use email, chat, IM, or text message about any of these transactions. You can't bring that into play. So when we get into Greg starts talking about hardening systems, uh, you could basically make the POS terminal, that's the only thing it's going to be able to do. You just strip it down to the, to the bare necessities, the base that you need, make sure that you get your patches and you can apply that, make sure you apply your security policies and your group policies that needed. But in a nutshell, shouldn't be anything else running on it and loaded on it at all. That's what it's for. That's the only thing it should be used for. Okay. Um, and then the incident response plan. This was all part of that that we got um, as part of one of these things he helped us develop. Basically, it's a breach statement procedures and response plan. Uh, and existing, some of you may have risk management or insurance policies like April had mentioned earlier that come into play here. Uh, I remember um, Mark Finster mentioning something at a meeting we were at about a breach and he has an insurance policy that dictates how he can respond and basically he's not allowed to respond. The insurance company takes it over and does that on their behalf and then brings him in to play. I don't know if ours is like that. I know we have risk management insurance. I know we have breach insurance, but I don't know if ours is set up exactly like that. And you can understand why. You know, you let them take it and, and go with it from there. Um, and then we have, um, as far as the incident response plan, some things that are included in that. We have response team members, right? Who's the group that's gonna do this? You have investigation steps and processes. You have documentation, obviously. Uh, you have processes and procedures for each individual step of the credit card vendor. Visa is going to have different procedures. MasterCard may have different procedures. Discover may have different procedures. You need there's a different steps that you need to follow for each and every one of those. They're each going to have their own contact people. In the event of a breach that you have to reach out to, each one of those needs to be treated separately in, in its entirety when you have this uh, happen. And then you're, it's also going to give us. Uh, incident notification procedures and contacts as far as internal and external. Who's going to be notified internally within the district? Who do we need to identify externally besides the police? Obviously, maybe we need to go to the FBI. Again, the insurance may step in and help you with, with these steps and how you're going to move forward. If not, you need to be aware of what, what, what they are and aren't going to do for you. Um, and then one of the final things that he did was he created uh, an end user um, security awareness training and assessment questions. So the people that are handling your cardholder data, typically these might be at your, at your high schools, your ASB secretaries, the ones that are doing the transactions in your ASB offices for the most part, right? Um, they need to have an annual training and they be, need to be able to pass a little short question quiz with questions on it for you to maintain that compliance piece. This is really no different. This is where you're talking about heavy lifting, right? Getting them to understand that, hey, this is something that you need to do and getting buy-in from the administration that this is something that they're gonna have to do annually to make sure that we have ourselves covered long-term, right? This isn't just once, forget it and you're done. It's something that you're gonna have to do annually to make sure. To boost your come walking in and start <laughs> right? Uh, we actually use safe schools. I don't know if any of you guys use safe schools for, for your general training. It has a nice little component. Uh, we're going to upload those, upload ours, and put it into the safe schools environment for us to do that training. It also has a logging and all that stuff, so we know when and all that stuff happens, and it helps us keep with some records and logs of those training events should we need them in the future. On the see on the training piece and the assessment, the requirement just says you do an annual training. It doesn't say how much training you have to do what type of training, you know, the format, it just says you need to do a training. So that's why we, 
we just found it easier to do basically through safe schools, answer a few questions, and then, you know, that, that for as, my, as far as I'm concerned, it meets that requirement. So. Is that yes and no to people like volunteers that kind of take the money the Yeah, it's a little different, yeah, a little, we haven't kind of crossed that bridge yet with volunteers and stuff just yet, because, you know. It, it's that it's yeah. that business workflow process is working with people and getting them to change their, you know, that, that's another step. For us. So here's here's the questions that he came up with for us. Obviously, the red is the correct answers. Uh, just pretty straightforward. Most of it is just um, you know common sense stuff. Here's a social engineering dressing like a maintenance staff member to gain access to sensitive areas of a data center is an example of you know those kinds of things. Um, User accounts, your computer is acting strangely. Just make them aware of what the environment is that they're in for the most part. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. The actual security awareness training itself. These are the questions that you get at the end of it. But overall, I think it was 30, 35 slides in total. It probably takes somebody a good 10, 15, 20 minutes to go through it in detail if they were paying attention and really wanted to understand uh, the context of what they were looking at. Yeah. Um, okay, secure, uh, information security policy. I'll just give you some highlights of some of these that we just discussed here. Um, basically, this particular policy or process standard, whatever you want to call it, uh, physical access to public accessible network jacks, right? So how many of you have your jacks turned off that aren't being used? How many of them are always hot, exactly, yeah. right? Those kinds of things come into play here now. So somebody can't walk up, plug in, gain access, and off they go. Wireless network points, gateways, all that kind of stuff. Handheld devices will be restricted. Uh, maintaining an inventory of card reader devices. We have a, we have that now. We know who has what assigned, what's a, what the building is, what the room number is, and who the responsible party is, the name of that responsible party for that particular device in that location. We have that now. I think ours is two pages now. Yeah. With regard to the network jacks being activated, um, that be specific to that VLAN that has the card reader information on it, yeah. right? Right. If you yeah. have a public jack that, you know, that's isn't, outside, isn't so on that VLAN, then, like in the you know, that's, a different, or something. that's a different set of security issues at that point, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. When we get to the segmentation part, I'll talk about how we do. I have a conference room. center that has some of that. Right, yeah, yeah. Pub, yeah. yeah. we have it's conference it's rooms it's with public center, jacks. Yes, right. Right. Yeah. So, okay, that's fine to clarify. Okay. Yeah. And we have, you know, we have a BYOD guest network, but you can, you know, process. I mean, no. Yeah, you can't get to our system. Again, you can go to exactly. Amazon, third party stuff, to, you know, but yeah, same thing. They don't, they don't talk to each other. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, performs uh, periodic inspection of your devices, make sure they haven't been tampered with, that kind of a thing. Um, VPN, we'll talk about that here in a minute. That's for the, the situation I talked about where you're using remote, uh, you're taking cardholder data remotely, not away from the location, from the high school, down the hill, for example. Um, and then with current card pressing system processes in place, you don't, again, you're not storing, <clears throat> and it's only on authorized systems, right? Um, the security policy. Uh, okay, viewing of cardholder data for accounting purposes will be limited to personnel with required access. So again, you're trying to really uh, tighten this up, who has access to the data, and only the people that have a need to know should be involved in that process. It's not open to everybody. And again, we just went through what the information uh, on the PCI cards uh, that you want to be aware of. Um, don't leave papers or reports around. A lot of this stuff is just common sense. That sometimes people don't think about it now when they're talking about cardholder data, receipts, all that kind of stuff. Um, how many of you remember the day when they used to swipe your credit card with the and get, take a carbon copy? You got a paper copy, yeah. they got a copy, and then there was the carbon copy that somehow had all that information that went in the garbage can, right? How many of those got taken out at night? <laughs> or is it just somebody walking by and pulled one of those out with, hey, look what I got now. It's like a lot less <laughs> you think so, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, don't ask a customer for that information, right? Uh, make sure receipts are truncated to the last four digits on a credit card number. That's been recently. I remember when we first come out with debit cards, that they used to have the whole number on it, right on it. The whole entire number was on the receipt. 
They've since, again, last four digits now uh, as you go forward. Uh, protect the cardholder data all the times. Uh, and the receipts in the cardholder data is not accessible, again, by those that, that don't have a need to know. Uh, physical security. Uh, entry controls that limit and monitor physical access to the systems. Again, that those POS terminals and stuff like that. Um, procedures will help exist personnel distinguish between employees and visitors in the area where cardholder data is acceptable. Uh, ASB offices, at least in our district, I can tend to walk in there at any time I want. Their door is always open, that kind of a thing. Um, maybe that's not the right thing to do now. Maybe you need to be, the door needs to be closed, make sure that the right people are supposed to be in there and so on and so forth. Give it a little more of a, of a, of a, of a make it harder for them to get in there. Visitors are always a big thing, talking about social engineering previously. Um, make sure that they have a token or a badge. Again, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Um, you may have part-time help uh, that does that game day or event help our district employees, but again, when they're taking money, they're not a district employee for that department. They're working for the high school as a contractor, subcontractor, if you will. Okay. Um, we use InTouch for our POS system, I have for quite a while now, HD Baker, a lot of you guys probably use the same thing. So this is some of the security things and recommendations, just kind of questions for you to think about as you go forward here. Uh, is a secured area found unlocked and cardholder information missing? Uh, have you noticed the new uh, unidentifiable equipment in the POS area? Do visitors logs alert you to suspicious activities? Have card readers been checked for skimming devices? Uh, receipts printing with the card credit card truncated to the last four digits. Uh, is the system just operating correctly as it should? Has it been compromised? Are you able to tell that and think, well, it's not behaving normally like I expected to. Something could be wrong here, that kind of a thing. Uh, it's okay for them to be a little bit inquisitive, I think, in these situations. And question, better to be safe than sorry. Uh, was the area secured overnight? You know, you see the pull down gate here. Is that always the case? I think this is actually a picture um, of the student store and yeah. one of the high, in Richland High School. Uh, so that gate's pulled down at night during the day that gate's open and the kids can can talk to people and take take transactions and so on and so forth one of the things that um that we haven't done with our asp stores is they're not online yet they haven't gotten there they also don't have they also have separate standalone systems each high school has its own standalone pos system in the asb office and that's how that's how they've done business that's how they've always done business one of the things that, that I would like to see, or at least I would like to try to get them to understand, is to move forward and, be, and use InTouch rather than their standalone systems. And then they could also put their information and do stuff online and have online sales, for example. Um, to me, it doesn't make any sense why grandma and grandpa can't buy a sweatshirt online for a Christmas gift or something to somebody else, right? Why do I have to go to the school to buy a sweatshirt? Why can't you put it online? And, and let's do business that way. Isn't that part of DECA and you know ASB activities and things like that? Teaching them how to do those kinds of things. Are all those so, wired? Those are wired. Yeah, these are all wired. The only things we don't we use wirelessly are the ones that, that go down to the offsite. Yes. So, Mike, you haven't had, from what I'm hearing, you haven't had pressure from your parents or your community to allow that yet. because that's what we were getting was we were getting requests. Why can't we do with you what we do with Amazon? Yeah. So I'm just sort of I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that myself, but I'm okay. sure that they have. And I've asked. We've had conversations. Why don't you guys, in CTE director, how come you're not online? Why don't you start pushing, you know, your sales online for your community and support them that way? I mean, it's a win-win if you think about it. As long as you do it right and you're above board and you, and you do your due diligence here, like we're talking about, why can't you sell sweatshirts or T-shirts online? You know, this, doesn't the InTouch have the online? It, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it does. So um, what do you do when you have a large admin department that continues to make decisions without involving IT, including the mind, <laughs> a bunch of iPads, and square devices? We only have till 10 o'clock. <laughs> we did literally learn about this in the last two weeks. Like, uh, all we started going to the high school, it's like, what is that? Why, are you, why do you have a square device? Oh, uh, as you can Yeah. Uh, and it's like, so we started looking around, it's like they bought all these iPads, they bought all these like uh, cell phone yep. cards. Right. And there's mounts people. Squares are actually like, one of the better ones for PCI. But it's yeah. still like not it's involved almost like in us. Right. And right. having these rogue iPads and stuff, so it was just like seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I 
jump through all this and set up couple schools with light speed, which is kind of like that. Sure. And, and mainstream, you know, across the board. Uh, so I think that this is, where are we in square, you know, where else they do I think that's what we're talking about. I mean, there has to be some way for you to rein that in. And only, we only have one repository that we, we call it. We Once we moved in touch from on-prem to the cloud, we developed our own domain. It's payments.rsd.edu. That's where you go to make payments. That's the only thing we offer to make online payments. Now, what you mentioned, I, I don't know that I, like you, I would probably find out after the fact. And then we would have some conversations with assistant soup on down to the principal, on down to what are you, the hell are you doing here? That kind of a thing, you know, unfortunately, I don't know if that's ever going to go away in our business, right? Things walk in the back door all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, also, here's some recommendations uh, for you guys. Uh, I would recommend that you get help. You can do this by yourself, right? But you don't have to, right? You don't have to do this by yourself. It's very time consuming. Uh, it's going to take you some time. And in full disclosure, we haven't completed our process yet. We still have the policies waiting to be developed by the in-house counsel who reports directly to the superintendent and conveniently those things get pushed to the side and have been pushed to the side for quite a while. So we need to ramp him back up, get him to complete those policies and finish that stuff off for us and then we'll be ready to go. We, we, are, we hope to be able to put this in play in time for this fall when football season kicks up and be ready to rock and roll with it then and be ready to go. Um, that's what my point earlier when you were saying about buy-in from administration, that's going to help you a lot here. Uh, like I mentioned just previously, we moved our uh, from on-prem to off-prem. We have our own domain. Uh, VPN and credit, uh, VPN controls and firewalls for off-site processing. Greg will talk about that in a minute here. And then uh, new hardware procedures for POS transactions. We have to treat these differently than we would a regular machine. My POS devices or machines aren't getting the same image that a regular user machine is getting, right? They're going to be different images, stripped down and hardened as best as you possibly can. Uh, Greg, you want to talk about Alien Vault? Uh, yeah, Alien Vault is just a third party single event, incident event management system. So, one of the requirements you do is you have to do daily review of your logs, right? Well, it's best to engage with one of these log management systems. You know, you can get Simple as Kiwi Logger for some of your sys logs, or there's, you know, Alien Vault's kind of a it's a pretty it's a decently priced one, but there's other, you know, freer ones out there. But you have to be able to monitor and maintain your logs, you know, especially if you have a breach and you have turnover law enforcement. You know, it's a lot easier from a single repository to go here you go. And at the same time, a lot of these that you know, SIEMs, you know, have their own intelligence behind, like you know, hey, we're seeing this threat, we're seeing this, you know, vulnerability. Um, and Alien Vault also does my internal vulnerability scans of those systems. So they have their own, you know, they know all the Windows updates, the, the vendor updates and patches, and they do, they do my scans automatically. And all I do is look at the report and say, yep, we're good to go. You know, I don't have to, you know, so I've got this, it took some time to get this set up. Just like any system, it takes time to set it up. But it's only, I don't want to say it's fire and forget. Nothing's ever fire and forget. but. You know, it, it makes my day when looking at these logs a little bit easier. And I've used this for other things. Like I said, I you know I, I use it for the entire network for other components. Uh, you know, account lockouts. You know, investigations. You know, machine. You know, student use of computers not related to PCI, but you know, I use it for other other events. So you get other uses out. Of it. But it's just a third party management uh, log management system is really what it boils down to. What what Alien Vault is, and they have you know. You get your feeds for, you know, the latest botnets and malwares and all the other stuff. You get feeds from them. They have their own security teams and things like that, just like any other uh, antivirus program, you know, malware, or malware bytes or MACV or you know, Trend Micro. You can subscribe to their, you know, services also through their system. But anyway, it has reports. You can and actually that was the thing about the nice thing about Alien Vault is they have. PCI custom reports that are you know specifically for PCI compliance. So if I needed to pull out you know uh, account lockouts for all my PCI users, I could pull a report to show all the account lockouts or unlocks of those PCI related users specifically. And it actually puts it at 3.2. You know, it gives the verbiage you know in the report, so you could pull those reports out of there. And you could do other custom reports too. But that's one. One of many other systems that are out there. So it's a, it's not 
cheap, but it's it's awesome. Yeah, it's a good yeah. system. So. And just think about all the like how much transactions are there. I, I'm sitting here thinking about. Well, it, it's I mean, a football I mean, game. We're a small school. I mean, small small. A hundred dollars worth of gate receipts for all this work. Kind of thing. Yeah. Again, it, it depends on the scale. Like for yeah. I like I said, if we I take advantage of using this for other stuff other than just PCI, right? You know, but again, there's other third-party stuff out there. And again, one, just meeting the requirements is you have to be able to do a daily review of your logs, right? So you can get something as simple as a, you know, a syslog server that dumps all your stuff in there, and then somehow you're able to go through those logs, right? And then, you know, count, you know, you have to track, you know, like I said, account lockouts. Well, I've got a tied right in AD that can show me all my account lockouts and unlocks. Like, you know, it shows me if an account was locked out and one of our help desk guys unlocked the account, it again shows me their name, right in the report. Well, what Mike said is really true. If you get PCI compliant, you've largely taken care of most of your IT security requirements. Yeah. That yeah. So if you ever have to go and undergo an IT security audit, or yeah. you want to, or I mean, just this generally is a, making your IT security. Yeah, it's a good domino on your on your behalf. It's a good SCI domino. Is one of the requirement, best practice yeah. requirements of any IT security. One of the things with the PCI, like I said, is Springboard. So at the same time, on the cybersecurity side of conversation, you know, you have the National Institute of Standards of Time Cybersecurity Framework. What I'm trying to do is kind of list all these things so I have like, you know, this is PCI requirement 1.2.1, but this is also cyber, you know, NIST Cybersecurity 1.1, right? So whichever form I'm coming in, I can pull out the different documents for it. You know, it's, it's, a, it, it's basically, it's a living document, you know, it's never, gonna, it's a never ending process, right? But yeah, that's the best thing I can do with it. Um, and then just taking a step back, we're talking about administration. You said uh, earlier about bringing it in from the outside. Uh, one of the things that we found, at least trying to implement this, when we started talking with the ASP secretaries was they were the biggest road <laughs> roadblock for us because we were trying to change how they did business on a daily basis, and they don't like that. They don't like that at all. When we tried to have conversations about uh, at the football stadium, for example, there's a lower ticket booth and there's a higher ticket booth. They wanted to take credit card receipts at the higher ticket booth. Wi-Fi wasn't bleeding out far enough, even though it was probably 25, 30 feet from the building. Because of the structure, all brick on the outside of the, of the gymnasium, Wi-Fi doesn't bleed out there. And they were adamant that they wanted to do this. Well, if you're going to do it, then we have to do it the other way. It's not just going to happen because you want it to happen. So, so we've gone round and round. That was one of those, like, you just, you know, me for his common sense. So where the football ticket booth was at, you know, 30 feet away was the ticket the, booth. For, for the basketball. Basketball, basketball right, windows the, where you walk up and buy right tickets. There. You got the, the yeah. high school entrance right there for the basketball. That's the ticket booth. To me, it's like, why not take your tickets right there? I've got wireless right there. And then they can just come in and, you know, you got the ticket taker right at the door. Now, they wanted people to be right at the ticket booth here. So I ended up having <laughs> to get Wi-Fi. Basically, I had to put an access point that would be able to shoot over to that booth so they could get it. Right. I mean, we accommodated it, but it's like people can just take their tickets over here, and you can do everything over there, and don't have to do any additional infrastructure for this. But again, you know, and it's just an old wooden, old one door right, wooden so shed. That's all there is to the ticket booth, right? right. You guys have them. You see them. Yeah, Nothing to it. Nice Davis School of Choice. Oh, this is great. This is free. This will cost you exactly right. X amount of dollars. Yeah. And the yeah. All of a sudden, it's not such yeah. a priority. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. the bill on that, unfortunately. Yeah, and then uh, just to finish up here. Um, make sure you do your, your annual uh, formal uh, and risk vulnerability assessments. Um, risk assessment, again, may be part of the insurance policy. You may have to do that anyway, and you're already doing that piece of it. Vulnerability assessments are a totally different thing. I don't know how many of you are doing them annually now. Anybody doing one annually, paying third party to serve that advice? You're in the minority, I think. We're close. We're, we've done ours. We started out five years. Now I'm down to three, and we just had one last year. We think we're going to do it annually. We're going to get to the point where we're going to do that annually. Uh, it'll help us, like you'd mentioned, on many different fronts. It just makes good business sense for the department for us to do that. Peace of mind to make sure that we have everything the way that it's supposed to be. What's that? Is that right? Quarterly? Wow. April's with Seattle Public. Uh, March. That's expensive. Well, no, not if you you can set up. This different iterations of it. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So we actually have one up almost like weekly from the Yeah, I have yeah, there's I have an intro when Mike was talking about we engaged a third party to do just a, a third party assessment, vulnerability assessment. And we're trying to I, I do stuff internally 
you know, on a regular basis, monthly and quarterly, depending on where these yeah. different pieces fit, you know, like your vulnerability assessment. But we usually bring in the third party because they have more specialized well, expertise. Well, the third parties can do subscription services. Where right. Get one quarterly yeah. And, so you and sometimes they, they, they found stuff that I didn't even think of, you know, in some of the assessments. Now, some of the stuff they found, I'm like, that doesn't make good. You know, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, they, they're like our phone, like our phones. We'll have to have a conversation about that. And I'm like, you know, yeah. somebody wants to attack my phones, go right ahead. You know, it's, yeah, I know. Printers are next. <clears throat> they're already here. We have. Um, okay, so here's a network segmentation. Greg, you want to speak to this? Yeah, all I did here is this, this is a kind of a really super, super, super high level view. You know the credit card data flow, which is one of the things you have is this diagram. So you got go, you know, from the school site through the network to the data center, outer firewall to the internet to in touch for the card processing. Just a very high level diagram for the credit card, you know, flow. Right. Go to the next slide. So again, just another high level diagram. I've got more in depth diagrams for each of the buildings and locations. So network segmentation. I've got a network seg uh, network segment just for PCI compliant or for our PCI VLAN um, for um, our environment is uh, we I, I use Juniper for our environment we have ruckus for our wireless and when uh so every PCI device we have I have an inventory list of all those um, behind the scenes here we use a third-party pro uh, uh, application called Bradford Network Century and what that service does is it's basically uh, network access control for individual ports okay so i know the individual windows workstation that's a p, p uh, use a pos station and so with bradford network century and juniper it's it's registered as a p as a pci device so if it plug i could take that device plug it into a network jack that's already hot and the network access control will switch the vlan automatically okay so i don't um, I don't have to go in and manually manage all of my VLAN, or my network jacks for the individual VLANs. If the way the system is set up, if I unplug that Windows machine from that network jack, it will revert back to the default VLAN. Okay, on that, on the switch. So it's just kind of a. So for me, it's it's easier. So I don't have to worry about, you know, if they want to move it to a another room to do whatever they want to do for an event. I don't care because the, the network will make the change for the PCI device. Same thing on the wireless side, everything, because with Ruckus and Bradford Network Century, um, you know, you, they could have a laptop that they can have at a basketball game, even right there. On the wireless, the laptop is isolated right on the VLAN. Basically, Ruckus will put it, drop it right on the VLAN for the wireless environment for, the, for that particular PCI, you know, to meet those requirements. Now, the challenge that I'm trying to find that we're Again, this is you know working with the business units is to get them to split and for the individual ASP secretaries, I got we're getting them to the point where they have to have a separate terminal just for their InTouch if they want to use InTouch at their desk. Right. Okay. So that's one of the big challenges you're going to have is that uh, because in that way, I with with InTouch the application any InTouch computer can be turned into a credit card swiping computer even though they might use it just for you know checking someone's you know account you know most of the time what they, the secretary is used for but it all it takes is taking a plug in a USB credit card swiper and now that terminal now becomes a credit card swiper okay so the next thing we're trying to do is basically get them a separate machine that they're going to use just for in touch regardless of what they're trying to use this same PCI VLAN at all schools? Yes. And is that a layer two level? So this is school A's? Oh no, it's it's layer it's layer three. Okay, so you're you're routing so that you separate the schools even if they're the same VLAN? Can a can a PCI device at school A hang a PCI device at the school? Yes. Yes. So that's kind of the violation I think. It's supposed to be different networks of different sites. Uh, it's not the way I read it. And, and that's again. That's where our third-party guy was. You know, he didn't interpret it that way. We would like to do it this way. Yes. But our PCI review, Heavier said that's. Uh, 
can certainly look at this. Again, it just says network segmentation. All the requirement says is network segmentation. Yeah, no, no. I'm, right. I'm happy that, that you right. made this work, and I'm going to try to make this work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like Richland said. Yeah. yeah. They, they come talk to me because I'm We've been reading, called out on that stuff you know, before, I'm, so go I'm, ahead. I, I, I read, you know, we all read no, compliance. No, no, I'm, yeah, I would yeah. love for this to be true. <laughs> right, right. So that's kind of the next somewhat challenge is getting, you know, everything to be just, and then what happens in, and it doesn't really get in, you know, very high level, that's where then the firewall comes into play because then only from this VLAN you can talk to the in-touch system. So that mit mitigate the situations where somebody goes out and buys iPads, well, if they're not registered with my system correctly, those iPads aren't going to connect to the in-touch system, right? That, so then that, that's where we're trying to get to that point where I can mitigate those outside because it happens. We get people that go and buy products or they get donated products. And so, you know, if it's not registered with me correctly and we don't have it on a list, it's not going to get, you know, in that VLAN and out the firewall to be able to see, you know, the in-touch process. So, anyway, yes? One of the things that really helped us communicate anyhow, we refer to those machines as cash registers. Yeah. And so you're like, well, obviously you don't want to work on a cash register. Yeah, it was again. It was when it's at the when it's at the counter. They they understood yeah. that concept, but it's when they some we had the InTouch software installed on their workstation because they want to be able to do receipts and or you know check accounts and things like that. And then now it's like you know now we you know they you have to have separate terminals. It's a convenience that's factor. That's the convenience. That's convenience. Factor. That's when we explain that. Well, we just turned your machine into a cash register. Yeah. Right. Now then you can't have you working in the cash register, so you need right. a cash register over here. And you need Yep. And the other thing with the segmentation is that there's no internet access. So those, yeah, those just about right, <laughs> and so there's no internet access from those point of sale machines, and that's where you know you're trying to do that sort of thing. And so I mean, we still have some, you know, you can we can still do Windows updates. You know, we still have the hooks into the VLAN to do Windows updates to those terminals. But as far as they they can't do anything else other than they're doing their to Facebook. right, they're not going to Facebook right. on that machine. You know, the next. Now, the one thing I've been trying to toss around, I've got to ask the question, is, is about virtual terminals or using virtual machines within the same machine. You know, because in, the, in that world, I can do some, I can still do segmentation, but it's, it's kind of great. It's kind of great. You know, because on Windows 10, I can run, you know, yeah. VMs in the, in the Windows machine, and I can do VLANs within that, but, you know, that's, but we have so many spare Windows machines right now that because of our Chromebook, Implementation. I've got piles of Windows machines, so as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> deploying a Windows machine for them is not a big deal. I used to work in the military. I used to work in secured environments, so working on an unclassified and a classified machine to me was a no-brainer. But again, secretaries are you know people have never done work that world before. You know, it's and the one person really is I think right now is my pain point is actually our finance guy that handles the entire system because he has. You know, access and all these things, and even getting him on board. I mean, he understands it, but again, convenience. Yeah, convenience. convenience. Right. You know, that's the thing because in touch, the other thing we do is with in touch, the downside with it, it's not a normal Windows install application. It's like a directory. So we actually have now with our inventory, software inventory system, we also do another scan of all the systems to make sure no one's taken that and thrown it on a system. But again, that's where this comes into play because even if they took a workstation and installed InTouch on it, they shouldn't be able to get to the InTouch system because it's not registered with our system correctly. So, anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I have a, a line of um, Chromebooks and Chromebooks and Chromebooks. We have some middle schools using school paint, um, which we had a couple years ago, where it, that's basically what they have. They, plug in a little USB card yeah. swiper and middle school registration day and they were just plugging in the Chromebooks. Right. I'm assuming that's probably how. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if we put the Chromebooks like on a PCI. Yeah, if you do some, I mean, again, yeah. it's network segmentation, you can do yeah, I know with Chromebooks you can do some separate stuff. You can lock down. Dedicate them. those Chromebooks to yeah, that you, use only. You can put them in kiosk mode. I mean, Chromebooks are a little different because it it's still needs. It's got to get to Google, so there's still some. Well, 
to why, yeah. but web filter stuff you've got to do. Because the school pays a website. So yeah, you're basically, right. school pay a web service? It, it is. So you're basically, all the swipers doing is basically manually typing in the card for you. It's basically like right. all the yeah, doing is And I don't know if they're fixing it. I don't know if they're fixing it. So you can ask them that. Too. Yeah. You can ask them for the PCI certification and what liability they assume for PCI. We, we have school pay, and they'll have you back a certification. Okay. Because it's all BT. Yeah. 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 That's what I was mentioning earlier. You got to make sure both ends yeah. are covered to do that. Yeah, the only other area that we kind of, I'm going to say we're brushing off, but we are, is like, the, uh, I don't, we've had like outside people, and that, even like the PTAs, they'll come in, they'll do events. Like, uh, we've had events yeah. come in, and they're like, oh, you know, we've got to do they credit want us card to set them up. You know, credit card processing, and we're like, no, if you've got, you know, your own. Wireless, whatever you know. Please, yeah, no, hotspot. No, hotspot. Otherwise, you just get on the BYOD, and yeah. that's all we're going to give you. Right. We, you know, we'll let you get access to BYOD, but it, that's a kind of again a gray area because they're using our network. And again, you know, it's we haven't quite got to that point of you know having those discussions because again, even a BYOD, how am I going to track that? These yeah, these are they handed the Verizon pucks out. Yeah. 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 So they use this where so you can talk to your network and right. responsibilities. Right. Yeah, these are the Christmas bazaars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, VPN. Yeah. So this one here is a slide of uh, I use for when they're off site. So yeah. if they're at the uh, at the soccer game, so basically we have again we have Windows laptops that are just locked down with the InTouch software on them. Um, basic, you know, Windows load. And then what we've got is a Fortinet 60D firewall. Yeah, it's just a little firewall. Um, it's a it's a just a wired firewall, but it has a 4G capable firewall. Okay, it's not a wire. It doesn't have wireless wireless in it, but it's 4G capable. So we use basically we get a little SIM card from Verizon from our for our card. I've got the SIM card plugged in, and I've got this basically this guy plugged up, configured that if you were to power up the firewall. It automatically creates a point-to-point -point VPN right back to our, our uh, Palo Alto on the other end. So all they got to do is take it out of the box, plug it in power, you know, get it cranking, and then it, it, it connects all directly, and then they connect the laptop directly physically into the firewall port. And then all they have access to through our firewall through this VPN is just in touch. No internet, no nothing else. They can't, they can't do anything else with this with these laptops other than just in touch credit card processing. So, Fortinet has there's only one. I think, I'm pretty sure there's maybe other, but I like the Fortinet ones. They're just small, like little boxes. How much, how much were those? Do you remember? Maybe fifteen hundred bucks. And then for the for the SIM card, we're paying like the lowest end of the process. I get and on I, I I subscribe to daily actually data reports from them. Um, you know, just and usually it's after the football games, but we've never have exceeded our data plan, which is like a five. <coughs> it's like a five meg data plan, you know, for those SIM cards. And like I said, I've got them so locked down that they can't, you know, and, and they boot up, and we've tested a thousand times, you know, and they boot up right, connect in, do the point to point, and away they go. We have, so, we have one for each high school right now. Yep, so both our high about schools. the soccer field, softball field, baseball fields were. But we typically haven't had Wi-Fi coverage we, we use, and they want to take point of sale credit cards. They use this yeah. in those places. So, because they used to go out and they used to do their phones, you know, and, and do a VPN connection from the laptop through this Verizon network back into our network to be able to go do the credit card processing. But when we, you know, a guy came and do the assessment, he was just like, no, no, no. no. That, you know, typically, so, that was a personal phone. Yeah, and that was a, typically a personal phone. So yeah. we got this route here. Athletic director. And then the <laughs> firewall, this, we, I check it out to the fire uh, to their to the one the finance secretary at the high school at the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, or during the summer, I'll get it back. I'll take it back, and then that's when I do my updates and things to the firewall during the summer. Plus, I use the firewall because when we build new schools, I usually have no networking out there, so I'll change the config so I can do other stuff on that firewall. So I get use out of it. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> That's it. That's the end of the presentation. Here's our contact information. Uh, like I said, I'll make sure that I pull this stuff together and, and get it up to JB so we can po post it. But if you'd like it uh, before then, uh, just send me an email. And I'll, I'll send it to you directly, too. I'll zip it up and send it to you if you want. But any other follow-up questions for us? Right. Well, thank you. Appreciate it.